个包。The Labour Party has changed. Chris Tarrant pledges Andrew, so the answer to these questions is yes. Junking promises that you made to your party. Now, when you ran as leader, you said you would end outsourcing yeah. in the NHS. That's out. You said that you would abolish the welfare payment, universal credit. That's out. And one of our viewers, Edmund, wants to know, he says, if Keir Starmer has broken all of his pledges to the Labour Party, how can the country expect to trust a word he says? So those pledges were to get him through that leadership election and job done. Uh, the, the next half... So it was a sleight of hand? I, I, I think he just sort of, as I said, almost kind of sets himself some homework and then completes it and, and ticks it off. For me, Starmer is right. Uh, and not even centre-right, right in every policy that he has made. And he's broken every promise he has made. Not because it was convenient to do so. I don't think there's anything extreme in calling for monopolies of gas, water, mail, rail and electricity to be taken into public ownership so we get the benefits, the profits. Not by fiddling around the edges. We're going to roll up our sleeves fix the problems, and improve our country. Um, and, you know, this runs through my blood. My mum was a nurse. Um, my sister was a nurse. My wife works for the NHS. Her mum was a doctor. Not just until the next person to lead the party comes along. There was one key word that was missing from Keir Starmer's speech today, and that is redistribution. And what they came in with was a four-letter word, hope. You aren't communicating hope. There is no ambition in evidence in what you're doing. And they had a much harder job than you've got to rebuild the country after the Second World War. But permanently, fundamentally, irrevocably. So you're more sort of Cameron Osborne than Blair Brown? If you analyse his behaviour, we see a, a striving authoritarianism. Part three of my series on Starmerism is the equivalent of the bell being rung in the final lap of the 10,000 meter Olympic final. Once this video was published, you can be rest assured that I am currently on a farm somewhere looking over a grateful universe after the work I put in during the past nine months. Within this video, I will reinforce the various U-turns and flip-flops made by the socialist Kia how Keir's Labour Party are offering One Nation Tory voters true conservative policies and that the whole establishment media are displaying their love for this genuine heir to Tony Blair. If you were to ask me the following question, what do you think of Sir Keir Rodney Starmer? You wouldn't have to employ the services of Batman to get the truth out of me. I would simply tell you, I believe that Keir is a lying, duplicitous, authoritarian from the seventh level of hell who will smile in your face while intricately planning your demise. And the fact that a new biography on Sir Keir Rodney Starmer is suggesting that Keir was assembling a team six months before the 2019 general election I would be so bold to say that my description is probably pretty accurate. I would also add that Keir is more than willing to break every pledge, promise and oath he has ever made. And I don't mean small promises like saying that you are going to give up chocolate for Lent. I'm talking about the pledges where you vow to renationalize utilities because nobody should be making profit from services people have to buy because they might end up, you know, dead. And just so that we are all on the same page, Keir wouldn't be breaking these pledges for something sensible like we are in the middle of being invaded by a foreign superpower. So, so I, I, I mentioned ditching policies. Every time you get come under pressure over a policy, you can it. Keir would simply like to break his promises in order to be voted into power. And in case you couldn't put together the puzzle pieces yet, Keir values winning over everything else, even party unity, and nothing will throw him off this mission. I mean, this guy would probably break a old woman's hip if it meant winning a game of tag. Whereas most of Sir Keir Rodney Starmer's most ardent supporters would like to forget these types of promises, there are others 
that will never. You have absolutely said you had 10 pledges, you were going to carry on the Corbyn legacy. And ever since, you've done nothing but distance yourself from the ideas which tens of thousands of people joined the Labour Party to support. And you know, things must be really bad when even the right-wing press are publishing articles asking whether Sakir Rodney Starmer can keep a promise like he can keep a awkward intense stare. I would need to check again but I don't think any of the pledges made during the leadership campaign are still relevant in 2024. This article is absolutely hilarious and I would suggest that you go and read it yourself but one of the things that did make me chuckle at the time I was recently reading the article was when I was reading the segment on climate justice and then you scroll up you will see headlines like ditching green spending pledge was about being straight with voters Keir Starmer chose the lesser of two evils by ditching his 28 billion green target Labour defends ditching green spending pledge as Tories attack I remember there's something about going to Sicily for your next luxury holiday <laughs> What's even funnier than this article was when the mainstream media was actually holding Keir Starmer's foot to the fire for his intention to break these pledges. You know, this was around the time they still believed he was left wing, an actual Jeremy Corbyn continuation candidate and ultimately a threat to the establishment. I'm completely pragmatic about this, um, not ideological about it. So it was a pragmatic a... pledge to win the leadership and you now jumped it. Well, look, we, we have to answer the question, what are you going to do about the soaring energy costs for people this winter? Jesus, this guy gives liars a bad name. So in The Independent, he said he just wants to win and just make Labour electable. With Channel 4, when he wants to break a pledge, he defines it as a pragmatic approach. Whichever explanation is the truth it doesn't matter because most people want to re-nationalize the energy companies I wonder what he would tell the BBC as to why his pledges no longer stand well when I was running for leader I made pledges which reflected my values um, since then we're now what three years on a lot has changed as you said at the head of the program we've been through Covid we are still going through uh, an awful conflict in Ukraine and the Tory government has done huge damage to our economy. What's that and got to do with you ditching a promise to end outsourcing in the NHS? Well, so far as the NHS is concerned, what we've said in the last week or two is we would make more use mm -hmm. of the private sector to clear... Yeah, f*** that noise. So let me just get this straight. You are blaming you dropping pledges because of the COVID pandemic, Ukraine being invaded by Russia and the Tory party. And when you are asked a direct question as to why you won't end outsourcing in the NHS, you explain that it is to clear a backlog, which has actually been in place since David Cameron and George Osborne gave us austerity on steroids. I think Keir Starmer might be a even more experienced pathological liar than Boris Johnson, but there's one thing that Keir Starmer will never be, and that's a friend to the ordinary hardworking person. Unlike someone else we know was really trying to to even the playing field for the most vulnerable in society. I don't think there's anything very extreme about saying that we will abolish all university tuition fees and make education free. What about Starting university with... tuition fees then? Will you remain committed to scrapping them in They're your first term? They're all pledges, Andrew. So the answer to these questions is yes. So university but... tuition fees being scrapped will be in a Starmer manifesto? Yes, that's why it's a pledge. the next election. Okay. His face tells us what his words wasn't, that he was clearly lying. The interviewer, Andrew Neil, also knew he was lying when he said, OK. Sure enough, he dropped the pledge to scrap tuition fees. I just love how this picture shows him doing something serious. And I just imagine him checking his Waitrose order for the third time before pressing checkout. Anyway, this article says that he decided to drop the pledge due to the economic climate, which he reliterates in a BBC interview. Well, look, I think the tuition fee system needs to be changed. I don't think it's working. I don't think anybody would say it's working. But looking at the damage that's been done to the economy, 
um, Rachel Reeves and I have had to be very clear that we will only make commitments that we can afford at the next general election. So let me get this straight. You will only make spending promises at the next general election that you know the country can afford, which means you aren't actually offering any new policies right now. Therefore, you are offering the status quo. So why would people not just vote? for the status quo you think that's because you will do everything with a heavy heart yeah and i thought ice skating would be easy for me because i'm short and i have a lower center of gravity anyway remember when liberals were so fascinated with keir starmer because he backed a second brexit referendum in addition to the fact that most people believe that it was keir starmer that influenced jeremy corbyn to put the pledge for a final say on brexit it in the 2019 Labour manifesto. I bet you never guess what Sir Keir Starmer is saying about Brexit today. I think we've got to um, go forward and make Brexit work. A lot of them want to see Brexit. Have you changed your views on that? We have exited the EU and we're not going back and let me be very clear in the North East about that. There's no case for rejoining. What I want to see now is not just Brexit done in the sense that we're technically out of the EU. I want to make it work. I want to make sure that we take advantage of the opportunities um, and that we have a clear plan for Brexit. So that's what I'm working on. Damn, your boy is cold-blooded. I remember the issue of EU membership for the UK was a red line for most Liberals and the biggest factor in them not voting for Jeremy Corbyn. Where are all the Remain fanatics when it comes to holding someone accountable for their promises? Something tells me that a large number of people have been hoodwinked, which would be sad if the people being hoodwinked weren't a bunch of Anyway, other U-turns include removing Palestinian recognition in the next general election manifesto, which shouldn't come as any type of surprise since Keir Starmer is comfortable with Palestine being ethnically cleansed today. Anyway, depressing realisations aside, all these U-turns are starting to scare the children. And please, will someone think of the children? Stop making U-turns We have already... We, will you just let me finish this and I'll come and talk to you about it? Thank you very much. And when the children aren't stopping Keir Starmer from making his big boy speeches, the Conservative Party are using their Twitter handle to highlight Keir Starmer's frequently changing policy positions. I mean, it would be easier to nail jelly to the wall than it is to get one consistent Keir pledge. And if you wanted to know what Labour is thinking this week, the Labour List website has a policy tracker. To be honest, I'm not sure how often they update it but it's a nice place to start. If you wanted to witness which could only be described as liberal hallucinations, look no further than the Guardian website, where in December 2022, they published the article, the fading Tories are stealing ideas from Labour. A transition has already begun. In the article, Andy highlights that the Conservatives adopted Labour policies on a energy price cap, a windfall tax on energy companies and raising state benefits in line with inflation. Not to mention making the right to request flexible working a day one right. I mean, at the time, it must have made Andy's little pee pee tingle when he wrote those words. But I don't even know if Labour still has these policy positions today. And if you're wondering how Andy is coping two years later, he has since wrote, endlessly shifting to the right won't save the country. At least Andy is realising that Labour is conservative under Sakir Rodney Starmer. There's also the article titled, Starmer sells himself on stability, but does that benefit the country? or just business and elites. Yeah, Andy, it's just elites. I don't know how else to explain this to you. And if you took your head out of your arse for one moment, you will realize it's just business and elites. Something Sakir Rodney Starmer's predecessor was trying to address. Under my leadership, the party produced two manifestos which would begin the process of redistribution of power and wealth in Britain, that would begin the process of bringing public service monopolies into public ownership, that would rebuild the National Health Service as a publicly run and publicly owned service, as well as giving hope to people through a green industrial revolution, giving hope to people through a foreign policy based on peace, on justice, on human rights and democracy, rather 
rather than going to war on behalf of the United States all the time. Since those two manifestos, we have been left with five very broad, fluid and flexible mission statements. And let's just take one of the mission statements at random. Break down the barriers to opportunity at every stage. I can only assume you are talking about breaking down the barriers to a good education and apprenticeship schemes. How do you achieve your potential as a country if kids aren't being given the education, the opportunities? It shouldn't just be the preserve of those who can afford to pay extra. Which is a very true statement. I would go as far as banning all private schools in existence. But how does Sir Kirvani Starmer plan to bridge the gap between the private schools and the state schools? In relation to schools, because in many schools, we don't have teachers in the subject matters that really matter. In maths, for example, we don't have the maths teachers in place. So what we've said is that we would remove the tax break for private schools and use that money, release that money, if you like, to our state schools to recruit 8,000 or so new teachers. What an incredibly specific policy funded in an incredibly specific way. Instead of removing tax breaks for private schools, why not just tax the rich? Also, there's a massive shortfall in your plan, Vic, here. Figures showed that 40,000 teachers quit in a single year. So the fact that you're planning to recruit 8,000 teachers still leaves you short of 32,000. And I managed to calculate that without a math teacher present. And with that being said, you'll be able to knock down the barriers to opportunities by continuing with the building new schools program. Well, the, the point is you say all of that, but then when we Say, well yeah okay so are you going to bring back new schools a new schools program you're unable to promise it because rachel reeves will tell you to right, shut up. okay never mind wes why don't you tell us what labor has planned for the nhs once they seize control the biggest expansion of the nhs workforce in history more doctors more nurses more health visitors funded by abolishing the non-dom tax status putting patients first making it easy to book appointment with your gp when you need one and making sure through faster diagnosis we get more effective and less expensive treatment. Better for patients and better value for money for the taxpayer. Wow, I just really love the energy you put in during that clip, Wes. And I don't want to nitpick, but you're going to fund all of that by just abolishing non-DOM tax status. Um, are you sure? Actually, what am I talking about? Of course you're sure. You sound just as sure as Keir when he is talking about his plan for the NHS. If you've got back pain and you want to see a physio, it ought to be possible, I think, to self-refer. If you've got internal bleeding and you just need a test, there ought to be a way that uh, doesn't involve going to see a GP. So we do need to lift the burden. Excellent, I love it. You have back pain, you go straight to the physio. Internal bleeding, just order a home test kit. It's as easy as testing for COVID. I swear to God, if Keir hasn't focus grouped these ideas, he's gonna be in real danger of looking like an idiot. Anyway, I wonder what Keir has planned for UK dentistry. Yeah. Dentistry, what, what are you gonna do? To dentistry you? need to be part of the change and reform that we have the NHS, Sally. So we've got to get it back on its feet then we've got to make it fit for the future, which means uh, going down um, the route of prevention of technology, of having community-based health and mental health. Uh, this is, Sally, one of the things I've set out is that if we're privileged enough to come into government to, to serve the country, then we will have missions or purpose. Oh my God, absolutely love it. Mr. Starmer slaying it as usual. Despite his answer being clear as mud, I think I picked up the gist. The imagery was fantastic. We need to get the NHS back on its feet because the NHS is presumably lying down at the moment. And then we're going to make it fit for purpose for the future. Technology, something about mental health. And then we move on to his purpose, which is to slash red tape and to write words such as rocket fuel and and turbocharge. Doesn't Keir just look like a big grown up boy in his lab coat and protective goggles? I do have a quick question. Why the hell is anyone wearing goggles in this picture? Okay, let's sidestep health and science for a moment. How is Labour when it comes to LGBT plus issues? There was the time that Keir tweeted his disgust at a homophobic attack. But when it comes to trans people, Labour comes across as a bit 
gender critical. We still have work to do to make sure that we are protecting single sex spaces based on biological sex, to make sure we have stronger protections when it comes to sex offenders uh, and when it comes to those convicted uh, with sexual offences, for example, rape. There to be safe spaces for biological women and prisons is one of the cases that's been highlighted as part of that. So I think this has been uh, something that's been a long, you know, had those arrangements in place in the law and it's right that there should be so. It is possible to uh, have a, a framework that both supports those who are vulnerable, who are trans, and also makes sure there are protections for women in it, these sorts of circumstances. Absolutely love it. Labour allowing TERFs and the Tory party to dictate the conversation around trans people. Let's go. Let's go. Call me naive, but if Labour can't be bothered to protect marginalised groups like trans people, what hope do black people have when a report revealed the Met Police only authorised baton rounds for black-led events? You know, because there's never any violence at football matches. So, what is Labour offering Scotland? Show them not just what the Tories and the SNP have done to this nation, but the Scotland that Labour can build. A fairer, greener, more dynamic Scotland. In a fairer, greener, more dynamic Labour Britain. Nice. Promises wrapped in empty slogans. With that being said, there is one approach that Labour wants to seem consistent on, and that's being economically reliable with the public purse. Never again will Labour be a party of protest, not public service. Never again will Labour fail to grasp that economic stability is the foundation of our ambitions. We're now facing the electorate and we're the party of economic stability of long term um, and ensuring that we get the investment we need to make our economy grow. OK, Keir, but for the love of God, will someone please think of the children? We, we are on the side of economic growth. OK, time out for you, Kia. You're even hitting the kids with slogans. Mr Starmer might just be the most broken of all records. Let's hear from someone else. When it comes to what the Labour Party would do about inflation rates, do you remember the time when Angela Rayner was seen as the next coming of a left-wing Labour leader? She was fierce, uncompromising, and defeated most opponents put in front of her. People loved it when she locked horns with Dominic Raab in PMQs. For me, beating Dominic Raab in a speaking competition is probably the equivalent of beating a hamster in an arm wrestling competition. You really shouldn't get any points for doing the obvious, but that whole passage in time seems like a fever dream or one of those Mandela effects because Angela Rayner went on to have this type of interaction on breakfast TV. Can you tell us exactly what Labour would be doing to bring inflation down faster? Well, we have a plan for growing the economy in the long term, but we also have said that quite clearly we need to get people into work. So we have to challenge the NHS waiting list. That's why we had a workforce plan that would bring more doctors and nurses into the NHS and bring waiting lists down. Um, we've got to do something around the growth of the economy so that people can get good jobs. And we've got to pay for our public services because we can't carry on the way things are because all of our public services seem to be in crisis at the moment and the government don't have a plan to deal with that. Just so we're all clear, the original question was, can you tell us exactly what Labour would be doing to bring inflation down faster? Please tell me down in the comments how the exact plan to bring down inflation includes speaking about NHS waiting lists. I think it needs to be studied how everyone who has come into contact with Keir Starmer has resulted in their brain turning to mush. Previously respected MPs who now currently sit in his shadow cabinet openly simp so hard that they put out tweets like this one. I don't know who's going to tell Mr Lam but giving powerful and inspirational speeches without the detail of policy is the literal definition of sticky plaster politics. By the way, David is the type of guy to get on national radio and openly complain about not being able to afford two mortgages. And here I am sitting in a box room dropping a tear for David Lammy when I can't even afford one mortgage. Have, have you forgotten Liz Trust and what she did? I don't know if you've got a mortgage like I have, but my mortgage, both of them have gone up huge 
hugely because of the decisions that she made. Decisions that we would never have made. And I will leave it to an LBC listener to perfectly describe the lack of ambition in the Labour Party's current economic position. Covid is bad. 2008 was terrible. But austerity has to be stopped. And you seem to be wanting to carry on worshipping the Treasury because you are an ex-banker, Bank of England banker, and you don't seem to be in, in making any kind of ambition clear to me as a voter or the public as, as voters whether you're prepared to rise to these challenges which are far worse than what we had in World War II. And this is why it's going to be so hard for me to vote for Labour at the next general election. They are clearly putting out their stall, which is saying that we will be the party of economic stability, which means we won't be spending and we just hope things will get better that way. Now, for all those people that work at The Guardian and the New Statesman who believe that Keir Starmer will be able to be pushed to the left once he is elected prime minister, I will leave you with the words of Tony Blair, whom I think Sir Keir Rodney Starmer is more than ready to emulate. We have been elected as New Labour and we will govern as new Labour. I've got one piece of advice for you. What's that, Joan? She said, look, when you're sitting there on the back benches and you find that both front benches are agreed on something, the working class are losing out. (laughs) Just remember that and you know which side you're on. Now, if you're wondering why I would insert that clip featuring Jeremy Corbyn, allow me one moment to explain. Imagine you are the leader of a major political party and you wanted to manage the expectations of the public. A public that has suffered under a merciless Tory administration for at least 13 years. And once you are able to seize power, you have no intention of governing as the Socialist Labour Party. So instead you pave the way, indicating that there isn't actually much difference between you and the current Prime Minister. Defence Secretary Grant Shapp said at the start of this week uh, that the UK was, quote, willing to take direct action in the Middle East. He was talking about repelling Houthi rebels in the Red Sea. Do do you agree with that? I agree with the government on this. Earlier we saw that Andy was uncontrollably wagging his tail because he noticed the Tory party were interested in four very lukewarm Labour policies. So allow me to respond to Andy by showing a series of policies and tactics the Labour party is more than happy to continue due to a lack of ambition or just being cold bastards. You said you came into politics to change things And yet all I've heard from you and the front bench is Tory policies for a Tory crisis. You're not going to tax wealth. You're not going to do much with income tax. You're leaving the profits of the banks, the water and the energy untouched. Not to mention, print newspaper The National ran a story whereby Rachel Reeves fails to deny that Labour will follow Conservative spending plans if they win the next general election. And let me just remind you that the Conservative spending plan is based on Rishi Sunak saying things like this, which is perfectly a reasonable thing to say, I guess. I know when I enter the GP practice, I don't expect the doctor to solve all my medical problems and when I enter a dry cleaners I don't expect the boss man to solve all my dirty clothes problems I guess I just need to take more personal responsibility so what is the point of Keir Starmer saying out loud that Labour Party won't spend out of the Tory mess if the Labour Party won't do it who the hell is we know why we can't Liz trusted that last year unfunded commitments in her case to tax cuts It crashed the economy and people are still paying the price. Only 10 minutes ago, we were talking about the mortgages um, and the increase in mortgages. That's the sort of price people are still paying for uh, unfunded commitments. So we can't do that. But, John, it doesn't mean I'm indifferent to the points that you made. It doesn't mean we won't have a strategy in government um, to deal with um, child poverty. And I know Keir has to do this to show some sort of financial competency. But truth be told, the public doesn't really care about how the government spends money as long as it's actually spent to make their lives better. That's why Keir Starmer's decision to not lift the child benefit cap established the most funny nickname ever, Sir Kid Starver. People across politics are really worried that they can't trust anybody. There's millions of people thinking, who speaks for me right now and when the number one trending thing on Twitter tonight was Sir 
kid starver, then I think that's not going to do the Labour Party any favours at but all. Twitter's not the real world, is it? Uh, nevertheless, Literally that speaks no. to what people worry about. You know, when, when if you're saying that stopping kids being in poverty with all the attendant long-term costs is not official a policy by Sir Keir Starmer is that he it's, would not, it, if they came sorry. to power, they would not overturn it. It's led to him being called Sir Kid Starver online. Which, in the grand scheme of things, is a pretty tame insult. Anyway, back to the government splashing cash. And even when it isn't spent to make their lives better, they soon forget about it because the media tells them to. For instance, can someone please explain to me where all the money on this image has gone? And you can best believe when Sir Keir Starmer says something, especially when it is favourable to the ruling class, you can best believe the Sith Lord himself, Tony Blair, will appear from his chambers to echo the message. Anyway, who remembers this moment in our history? Uh, well, these are the latest pictures um, from Portland in Dorset. Um, arrivals at that barge, the Bibby Stockholm, the first arrivals, we understand around 50 uh, single males will be housed on board the barge uh, in this, the, the first stage of opening. Uh, it is expected that up to 500 people uh, will be housed on that barge uh, between now and the autumn. Um, but these are uh, another group of arrivals. They've been coming in by bus, uh, boarding the barge on Portland. Um, we have our correspondent Dan Whitehead uh, down there in Portland uh, following the progress uh, and keeping us up to date with what is going on. But these are the latest pictures we have of some of those new arrivals more throughout the day here on Sky News. I cannot stress this enough, but it blows my actual mind that I witnessed a government steal their policies from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. There's an actual ship within the Marvel Cinematic Universe called The Raft. And guess who they imprison there? Some of the most dangerous supervillains and sometimes heroes, but what's really a hero when you think about it, who were deemed not safe enough to be imprisoned near land. The UK government watched Captain American Civil War and said, yes, we need a boat for asylum seekers. I honestly thought I was tripping on acid until I saw the Labour Party go along with this plan. So I note that you, you don't say that Labour would immediately close these barges. You're accepting that you may have to use them depending on what the situation is. Now, it wouldn't take Notre Dame to predict when you rush to house human beings on a boat that hasn't been properly checked, then you treat them like animals. Bad things are definitely going to result. And boy, did it get bad. When did you know there was a risk of Legionella on the barge? You've spoken about barges. On the baby Stockholm, when did you hear about that? Well, ministers were, were made aware of that on, on Thursday evening, and, and obviously that's been discussed uh, with the council in terms of uh, the importance of that information coming uh, across quicker. So ministers were aware on, on Thursday evening. Dorset council uh, they say they told a Home Office contractor on Monday night. I'm saying health is your brief. You would know how dangerous Legionella is and how important it is to act urgently in that situation. If they... If somebody, if a Home Office contractor knew on Monday night, do you think it's too long for then a minister to hear on Thursday? But isn't, isn't a normal procedure if you are going to, you know, house people somewhere and you need to do tests, you wait for the results of the tests before you start putting the people in. And if the, if the results of the tests hadn't come back, why were people allowed to go in? Well, this is a standard thing the council had done as part. There's no reason to suggest there were concerns. As a precaution, the tests were done as soon as ministers were notified on Thursday night that there were some concerns with that. And may I remind you, this is the shambolic policy Labour was happy to continue with. And it doesn't stop there because things escalate very quickly. Imagine you're a migrant who has come to the UK for a better life to find that the government has put you on a boat with Legionella's disease. I don't believe they would put livestock in these types of conditions. Uh, some breaking news and an asylum seeker on board the Bibby Stockholm barge docked in Dorset has died. Uh, that's according to PA. Um, quick reaction to that from Sam Coates, our deputy political editor, who's with me now. And Sam, this is, of course, first and foremost, a human tragedy. 
uh, and we don't know any of the details uh, further around how this happened. And yet, here is the result of putting humans in these conditions. And when the UK government isn't housing you with killer bacteria, they are proposing tagging you like some type of criminal. Some think Keir Starmer and his goonies enthusiastically support. Well, we need to support people who are fleeing persecution and we need to speed up the process of asylum in this country because people are being housed in hotels for a very long period of time, which is not appropriate. We need to speed up the process so that people can get the support that they need. So the answer is yes, in certain circumstances, you would support I, I, tagging I illegal I Yes, I can't be more, yeah, I can't be more clearer. And I said that the context to that is that we should be supporting people. We should be, um, uh, you know, speeding up the asylum process so that people are given the support in a timely manner and are not kept in hotels for months on end. One way you can support migrants is to maybe provide them with safer places to live once they arrive here, but also give them opportunities to work, contribute to the economy, make their lives more better and fulfilled. But this response from Angela Rayner shouldn't come as any surprise. As we have already noticed, anybody that stays within the facility of Keir Starmer for too long instantly becomes a right winger. Also Keir Starmer has already admitted there is little difference on immigration between Labour and the Tories. Yes you got that right. The most right wing conservative party we've had in decades has similar immigration policies with the supposed left wing Labour party. So that's a yes you would get rid of it and use the money elsewhere. We don't think the Rwanda scheme is working, it's failing, and that's why we think the right thing to do is to replace it with a proper plan to go after the criminal gangs rather than writing all of these checks to Rwanda for a policy that's continually failing, actually use that money to go after the criminal gangs and make sure that you can prevent these dangerous boat crossings and protect our border security. Other things to make you smile, the Conservative Party aren't the only ones ready to privatise the NHS. His health secretary speaks about saving the NHS while receiving vast sums of money from private health care providers. FYI, editing in this conspiratory video from Twitter at different times during this series has probably been the highlight of my life. Moving on, Keir Starmer being the aspiring authoritarian has no plans to bin the protest arrest laws enacted by this Tory government, showing further evidence that Mr Starmer believes protest is a privilege and not a right. Um, so I fiercely defend the right to protest, um, including on this issue, of course, but I don't think we can escape the fact that there are these, the, these threats, um, not necessarily in the protest, but um, in and around, which we must be very, very careful about. And just to close out this section, I'm tired of witnessing politicians from supposed politically opposing parties trying to show the public that they have common ground somewhere. Rachel Reeves, I don't care that you can play chess. I don't care that the Prime Minister can play chess. The fact that you are challenging him to a chess match only illustrates to me that you are a pair of posh privileged that don't care about the interests of the most vulnerable in this country. Imagine challenging the Prime Minister to a game of chess when there is a literal cost of living crisis happening. Okay, this is the part of the video where I double back on themes introduced in the first two parts of this series. As we have already seen in this third part, the Labour Party is not interested in introducing radical ideas, preferring to offer the most tame of ideas. And when they aren't agreeing with Tory spending plans, they are comfortable with just carrying on with dangerous and disastrous Tory policies enacted. With that being said, I still think it's really interesting to revisit how Sir Keir Rodney Starmer has fundamentally changed the makeup of the Labour Party membership. And this unfortunately starts with Jewish people who hold left-wing values. In some Labour Party constituencies, the situation has deteriorated to the point where Jews who do not support Israel or who continue to support former Labour Party leader Jeremy Corbyn have become too frightened to attend party meetings for fear of 
intimidation and abuse. I might be as bold to say that the Labour Party under Keir Starmer has expelled more Jewish party members than any other Labour leader. And I could take the time to once again reference the article showing that there is evidence that Jewish members were being expelled for anti-Semitism. But I do find that there is something insidious that the current Labour Party leadership and the mainstream media aren't exactly taking the claims made by left-wing Jewish people seriously because they have been described by those with a louder voice as being minorities within the wider Jewish population as if that's a good enough reason to ignore people. The dismissing and gaslighting is on an epic scale and this attack on left-wing Jewish members forms part of a wider plan to expel left-wingers in general. He has silenced people with his own party by using false claims of anti-Semitism. Secondly, you lied to us about uniting the party. I'm still a Labour Party member, and you've expelled and witch-hunted in the most vicious way I've ever seen in my lifetime. The quiet demeanour hides a ruthless streak, which Starmer has deployed to sideline the Labour left. And I think the, the problem with this is that this is a move from Keir Starmer um, and his leadership to say that there is no space for disagreement in the Labour Party. Um, you know, there's no space for people who want to champion the policies we stand for, like public ownership, wealth taxes, championing anti-racism, all of these things. There seems to be no space for discussion in. And we're seeing people, not just Jeremy, actually, you know, we're seeing a lot of people blocked from standing to be Labour candidates because they have taken different positions to Keir Starmer. Right. And that's not an acceptable situation to find ourselves in as a party. If we want to bring forward the best, you know, best candidates, local talent, and make sure that we protect, you know, local democracy and keep people's faith in the Labour Party, then those, you know, we need to be challenging Keir on his practice here. And I would like to take the time to share a open democracy article titled Is Labour Purging the Left? Inside the Party's Embattled Selection Process. And you can go without saying that it is a very grim read. Imagine being told that you can't run as a Labour candidate because you liked one solitary tweet by former Green Party leader Caroline Lucas a few years ago. Pathetic. And for all we know, that tweet could have said, doesn't the sun look nice today? For heaven's sake, I distinctly remember Sir Keir Rodney Starmer saying that he has so many Tory friends. And not to mention, he's already said he's not much different from the Tories on immigration. Another would-be candidate was struck off because she liked a tweet by Nicola Sturgeon. And some poor person up in Glasgow was blocked because he tweeted in support of Jeremy Corbyn, the former leader of the Labour Party. This is beyond insane. Okay this is becoming quite comical because another person was blocked due to signing a petition allegedly. Whereas most of the people deselected or blocked from standing had previously been backed by the socialist campaign group Momentum, the same level of scrutiny isn't being applied to everybody. Then the article highlights that Barkin and Dagenham council leader joked about being a black man at a Black History Month event, which admittedly is a pretty poor joke. And I wouldn't want a left winger to be expelled because of that. But a fully grown man describing a 15 year old girl as very attractive, dark, and dusky and very nice and very slim doesn't just need to be deselected he needs to be thrown in jail to prison under the prison get rid of him it should also be noted that the democratic socialist labor party has no right of appeal once a final decision is made this whole article has driven me to think why the hell was i ever a labor member in the first place and speeches like this will never convince me that the labor party is a nice place to be to all those who dream of a Britain that is fairer, greener, more dynamic, to all those who want to make this great country greater still, I say, the door is open, come in, make us your home again. So of course I have ripped up my membership card, cancelled my direct debit, just like the other 169,999 members that have left since 2018. Uh, Peter Mandelson close friend of Jeffrey Epstein, which we don't mention enough, actually, yeah. um, said on LBC, oh, you know, Starmer's done such a great job 
of pushing out thousands of these people from the party. But not to worry, at least 50,000 people joined in a year. Must be the residual UKIP and Conservative members that have felt they don't have a home within any other party. And I felt I should also highlight, Sir Keir Starmer was asked about Peter Mandelson and Jeffrey Epstein on establishment news. And as you can imagine, he gave the most perplexing answer. On Peter Mandelson, look, in and I do try to give pretty full answers in these sessions. I don't know any more than you do. Um, and therefore, um, there's not really much I can add to um, what you already know, I'm afraid. And, um, you know, that's um, simply the state of the uh, affairs. Thank you, Jim. So why is it important that I discuss the makeup of the current Labour membership and how Sir Keir Rodney Starmer has driven out left-wingers like myself? It's because Keir Starmer is positioning himself as the centre candidate, just like Tony Blair did in 1996. And by doing this, you are showing you are not a threat to the establishment and those that hold all of the power. So as soon as he needed to take uh, establishment lines and it was conducive to his career he just flipped straight away and one way to illustrate that is by showing everyone how can i be a threat to the establishment when i have no more left wingers or progressives in my membership and i'm actively deselecting and blocking people that hold left wing politics from even standing as labor candidates this has allowed keir starmer to do the equivalent of taking off your bra after a long day at work and professing to the world that he is indeed the heir to blair or at least you hope to be tony blair's won three elections so when i've won three elections i will think think of. i will i'll accept uh, that I have uh, achieved what he achieved. He won three elections, he'd put the Labour Party in power for 13 years and changed millions of lives for the better. And when Keir Starmer isn't pontificating about the achievements of Tony Blair, he gets to sit in front of an audience with him, practicing their hive mind slash double act. And he gets to look Tony in the face and say, do you love me now, daddy? And that's why we're having a row at the moment about tough choices. Yep. Because we need to cr the, the stability in our economy is absolutely vital as a stepping stone to getting onto those missions. So when people say, look, you should be making all these spending commitments and... Well, uh, my first reaction, you know, we keep saying collectively as a party, we've got to take tough decisions. And in the abstract, everyone says, that's right, Keir. <laughs> and then we get a tough decision. We've been in one of those for the last few days. Say, well, I don't like that. Can we not just not make that one? Um, I'm sure there's another tough decision somewhere else that we could make. Um, but we have to take the tough decisions. And this isn't, you know, this isn't some sort of reflection on some focus group that says, you know, we'd like Labour to um, have an economic straitjacket on. It's the fundamentals. Liz Truss was very different um, to others. She proved the thesis that if you make unfunded uh, commitments, uh, then the economy um, is damaged and working people pay the price. Right, that could be and tax that, or spending, right? That could be tax. For her, it was unfunded uh, tax cuts, but it could be unfunded spending. So if you want proof that um, unfunded commitments cause economic damage, which is then, you know, visited on working people, you've got a living example of that. And that, that can come from both sides of politics. And so it's a fundamental. I will not let the next Labour government um, get anywhere near the equivalent of what Liz Truss did. Because it, it, it will... Like a bunch of seals clapping for their next bucket of fish. But it is these types of interactions where it has led Keir to believe that he will be the second coming of Tony Blair by virtue of simply winning by-elections. Look, these are two very, very important victories for us. Um, each of those results is extraordinary. Um, it's history in the making. Um, and I think that reflects the fact that we are a changed Labour Party, that we are putting a positive case for change to the country. And after 13 years of failure and decline under this Conservative government, I think people are looking for change. But we take it humbly. In my opinion, I'm not sure how much you can take humbly when you say things like extraordinary win and history in the making. Oh yeah, here's my trophy cabinet. First black person under six foot to win all of these. If only you could see me blush by showing you all of these awards. Unless the interviewer edited out the part where he said bragging. You know, like 
humbly bragging because who do you think Sakir Rodney Starmer is talking to when he says things like this? I think that reflects the fact that we are a changed Labour Party. We've changed our party and we're ready to change Britain. On the surface he's talking to the people that believe he is saying look everybody the Labour Party no longer has anti-semitism whereas I believe he is really talking to the establishment. But the story I did about Starmer was that I don't know if uh, you saw this, but um, a couple of weeks ago, or maybe like a month ago, Starmer attended Rupert Murdoch's summer party as this party every every uh, summer where the sort of establishment go and, and like bow down to him mm -hmm. and say thanks for everything you do. Indicating that he's not just a centralist, but that he is the living embodiment of the Tories under David Cameron and George Osborne. Therefore, he is not a threat to the establishment and that their interests will be protected under his leadership. Just remember that the same BBC that painted Jeremy Corbyn as a Russian asset also cannot hide their admiration for Keir Starmer becoming the next Labour Prime Minister. First, this is a political fast learner who soon realised that abandoning the Corbyn era was just the first modest step he would have to take. Turning to Gordon Brown and then Tony Blair were, he decided, vital in understanding how to win. Proclaiming that you admire the determination of a person to win because they turned their back on the jam maker and decided to seek the guidance of war criminals that invaded Afghanistan and Iraq is definitely something I could not say out loud. And the Tony Blair glazing doesn't stop there. There's a trait Keir Starmer shares with Tony Blair, fear of Labour complacency. And it's not just the BBC that is comfortable with accepting Tony Blair back into the mainstream, viewing him as some type of mentor and treating him like a normal human being and not the lying bloodthirsty maniac that he clearly is. Even LBC radio hosts who claim to be progressive, hailing from Liverpool and being born to Irish parents, believe there is something we could all learn from Tony Blair. But having tried twice and not won an election with a much more left-wing man as leader, um, that uh -huh. you that there is some sense in looking at shifting further back to the right to the centre, and also even looking at what the Blairites did, not copying what they did, but looking oh, at how looking at how they got into power. I just love how Sheila tried to replace shift into the right with shift into the center. Sorry, we already heard it and actually saw it being written as well. And just for clarity, there's nothing to be looked at if you are binning your principles and your policies just to be elected leader of a country. And if you needed any further proof that Tony Blair was the demon offspring of Margaret Thatcher and the only reason that New Labour's legacy was so thoroughly trashed was only to enable the Conservative Party to be elected in 2010. But deep down, every Tory knew that Tony Blair was one of theirs. Just look how Times Radio is not only waving the flag for Tony Blair, but absolutely standing the man. There seems to be less distance between Tony Blair and Keir Starmer this week, as it seems that, that he's sort of accepted that Starmer is finally, the, you know, the heir to Blair, which was a, a phrase that we spoke about a lot ever since 2007 when Blair st stepped down. Ask yourself one question. Why were Conservatives looking for the heir to Blair in 2007 when he finally stepped down if Gordon Brown was already selected to fill the void? It's because Tony Blair has always been and will always be their guy. I think it is a bit of a gamble because obviously opinion is split over Tony Blair and his legacy, uh, particularly in regards to the Iraq war. However, I think that, there, that, that Tony Blair has had a renaissance in in most more recent years, certainly since COVID. What the f*** are you talking about? What do you mean a renaissance? This isn't Robert Downey Jr. securing the role of Iron Man after a long criminal history. This is a man being held up as a beacon of light after slaughtering countless brown people. There has been a kind of change of opinion uh, a sort of sea change of opinion, really, in terms of whether Tony Blair is sort of a goodie or a baddie, as it were. And I think, by and large, the public have decided he's on the side of good. <laughs> These people are totally unhinged. And with the Financial Times writing headlines like this, you really start to understand the landscape of politics in the UK. Do you notice how they write, vilified as a war criminal by some in Labour? Suggesting that no one outside of the Labour left believe that Tony Blair is a war criminal and everybody outside of this fringe group should see Tony Blair as a good man 
that probably did a few bad things. Circling back to Keir Starmer, there are a few right-wing fascists that dislike him, but it's mainly for transphobic reasons, not realizing that Keir Starmer isn't exactly an ally of the trans community. Um, well, Scottish Labour disagrees with you that they're continuing to back demedicalizing uh, the process. Yeah, so, we, we don't agree. We, we don't think that um, self-identification is the right way forward. Um, we reflect on what happened in Scotland. What? And therefore, there should... Well, as you know, there was a law passed that... Um, if you wanted an understanding of how much the Ovington window has shifted to the right in this country and how batch crazy everybody is, all you need to do is make a quick trip to the supposedly left-wing newspaper for guardian but it's also interesting why he's how he's protected by the liberal media great to see polly say we should only judge labor once they are in power and have some type of documented record polly must have took a trip to costco and restocked on patients because she must have had famine level supplies of patients while jeremy corbyn was leader and then there's claire who wrote the article a centralist labor is back but this time it cannot take the working class for granted. Claire previously wrote, the center left is on the up around the world. Here's what Keir Starmer can learn from it. So are we to assume that even Claire has shifted to the right? Because in this article, Claire is talking about social democracy. I have no idea what Claire was seeing in 2023 that made her think Keir Starmer is anywhere near a social democracy. But the article takes time to notice that the UK for whatever reason tends to vote for right-wing parties but the Labour Party under Keir Starmer should still take some type of learning from the centre-left. Safe to say Sir Keir Rondi Starmer probably read this article and said nah and then there's Raphael who knocked us up the side of the head with the article titled Keir Starmer's caution may be frustrating but it's right Voters no longer trust big promises. FYI, people no longer trust promises from people that continue to break them. Highlights from this article include, that feels like a bleak proposition to those activists and radicals of the left and right who like to break things and see incremental change as pointless fidgeting with the status quo. Along with, under his leadership, a dysfunctional and bitterly divided party that looked destined for another decade in the wilderness has been turned around and brought to the threshold of power. Someone get this man some milk and cookies. Because of his lack of food and water, his brain is short circuiting. Anyway, as I've mentioned before in this video and in the previous two videos, those with an investigative eye were fully aware of Keir Starmer being embedded within the establishment. He started at the CPS in 2008 and his Time at the CPS is just, when you look into it, it's marked by just how reactionary and how establishment friendly he is. Was it wrong for Nike to change the uh, cross of St. George on the back of the New England kit? Yeah, I think it was. And I think what it's was hard. It they were doing? Look, I mean, as you know, I'm a big football fan. I go to England games, mm. men, the women's game, um, and the flag is used by everybody. It is a unified, it doesn't need to be changed. We just need to be proud of it. So and the amazing thing was that he joined when he was in Corbyn's shadow cabinet. So he joined, uh, it's hard to know because it specifically, but he joined between 2017 to 18. Now he was Shadow Brexit Secretary from 2016 to 19. And in case you were wondering, the Trilateral Commission is best described as what conspiracy theorists would call the Illuminati, but you know, openly say that they are protecting the commercial and political interests of private capital. And since becoming Labour leader, Keir Starmer can profess his love for the private sector. Well, um, the immediate problem is obviously um, the waiting lists. And um, one of the uh, issues that we've looked at is whether or not uh, we're using the private sector effectively. A, a number of people do go as NHS patients to the private sector. Um, our research shows that that's been underused and we could do more of it. And that would clear, you know, 230,000 people off the waiting so list every year. So more use of the year. private sector in the NHS under Labour? Yes. And I guess Keir Starmer believes the private sector will be able to address all of the issues he raised while having their WWE type slanging match within the House of Commons. He's not promising that people would get to see a doctor in a few days like they did under Labour. 
He's not promising that cancer patients would get urgent treatment, as they did under Labour. He's not even promising an NHS that puts patients first, like it did under Labour. No, he's promising that, that one day, although we can't say when, their record high waiting list will stop growing. And that's it. After 13 years in government, what does it say that the best they can offer is that at some point they might stop making things worse? Which ironically happens to be the exact campaign slogan from the Labour Party. Anyway, when Keir Starmer isn't telling private owners that they can always find work with him, he is abandoning all of the tenants he probably learnt while being a human rights lawyer and saying that it's right that a young British woman no longer has any citizenship. I want to ask you about Shamima Begum. In 2019, you said stripping her of her British citizenship was the wrong decision. She's lost her appeal to regain it. Should she be allowed to appeal again? Should she be allowed back here in order to face justice in the UK? I think the court decision yesterday is the right decision. Obviously, the court has looked at all of the information, got all the evidence, not only that was available at the time, but all the evidence that have, that's available since then. National security has to come first. And this is where liberals must really struggle. And when I say liberals, I mean those liberals that share the same economic values as conservatives. However, that believe because we have elections, we live in a pinnacle democratic society and see pride parades as good things means that they are miles apart from conservatives. So they get really upset when they see Kirsten Starmer doing something that only a Tory would do. These are the type of liberals that will simultaneously advocate for the rights of the Ukraine and Israel to defend themselves. Then you have the guy that gave us the thick of it and that Stalin movie using the new statesman to pour his heart out to Keir Starmer. Telling Keir Starmer continuing to starve children may not be a liberal value but using phrases such as financial recklessness indicates to me that you are not as far from the conservatives as you think because you still have in the back of your minds this myth of economic stability and I have to reiterate the right wing press love this version of Keir Starmer he has pushed out the progressives from his party he isn't a threat to the establishment and Keir Starmer has moved to a place that they have redefined as the centre ground it's really interesting if you look at how Starmer's approach has changed since he was elected as Labour leader. I mean, at the beginning, he was talking about uh, a unity party, very much bringing the left along with him. Uh, you know, I think he would have been nervous to have shared a platform with Tony Blair because the scars of the Iraq war still loom large, obviously, within the party. But he's tiptoed uh, very uh, astutely towards the centre ground. And I completely understand why this move to the supposed centre ground is very disappointing to liberals that hitched their wagon to Keir Starmer believing he was also a liberal. I fully understand this because I was once a liberal. Here I am taking time out, enjoying the Notting Hill Carnival to take a photo with the failed experiment which was supposed to be the UK Barack Obama. This is peak liberal behaviour. If you're wondering how I escaped being a liberal, it's because of how Keir Starmer has turned the Labour Party against what people would call their choir. So when Keir Starmer says things like this... I can't really say, um, you'd, we don't know what you stand for, we haven't said anything out unless you've just um, really not paid very much attention to what's been said over the last year or so. I would respond by saying the big issue is that people have been listening too carefully to what he has been saying because particularly those from the Labour left, they have been able to identify broken promises, U-turns and outright lies which fly in the face of what could be called core Labour values. I already showed Keir Starmer defending the use of the private sector within the NHS but it goes deeper than that. If this isn't a menacing threat, I don't know what is. And then there is his reluctance to back nurses striking, despite him always telling us his mum was a nurse. Do you support the nurses' strike? Well, look, I empathise with the nurses who've been put in a really difficult position. Are the nurses position. right to strike? Well, look, I've always supported the right to strike, but what I want to see is the government get round the table and resolve these issues. I mean, to be fair, there is evidence of Keir Starmer backing trade unions and the right to strike. I'm Keir Starmer and I'm a proud trade union. Under this Tory government, we've seen a sustained attack on working people and the unions that fight for them every day. For better, fairer pay for better rights at work, 
for safe working conditions, for the services that we rely on, that this government has allowed to fall apart, but which Labour and government will protect. Here is Keir on a picket line. It almost looks photoshopped, but I guess he just doesn't like the nurses. Nah, I'm joking. Keir Starmer is equal opportunist in every sense of the phrase, hating all workers in an equal amount. We are the sixth richest country in this world. We are not a poor country. And the fact that we have got workers uh, going out on strike just to get a square deal, just so they can put food on their table, we need to be able to react to these crises. And that's why we need the Labour government who will proudly support these workers, who will proudly say, we need to read distribute this wealth we need to have a square deal for working people and who will stand up and stand shoulder to shoulder with them um, to, to deal with the crises that we're facing. Labour was called out for partly rolling back on workers rights pledges and then you had the plucky Angela Rayner that had to come out and argue that changing wording of pledges on workers rights is far from watering down the policy. Yeah and how can I be cheating on my girlfriend if I use protection wear a blindfold and think of her throughout the entire experience. Anyway, I believe there is a tax issue that Angela Rayner should be dealing with. So when Keir Starmer isn't ignoring the strike action carried out by the nurses, the junior doctors, the railway workers, he isn't meeting with the National Policy Forum to assert his will and ensure that only neocon policies make it into the next Labour manifesto. He is openly displaying friction with the most powerful Labour politician in the country. Yes, I'm talking about the Mayor of Londonistan, Sadiq Khan. I'm in no doubt that it can be embarrassing for you as Labour leader to have the Mayor of London provide free school meals for children when the whole internet is is dubbing you Sir Kid Starver. Would you support that Labour government in its current policy of a two-child benefit cap? I support the Labour government in that policy. I think we're going to inherit an absolute economic mess from the Conservatives when we take power. We're going to have to make extremely difficult decisions once we do. And I support the Labour government in doing so 100%. And when you can't bring yourself to say if the ULES expansion was right, but insist there are other ways to cut pollution, how comes you weren't able to provide those other ways for your Labour colleague? Instead, you just blame him for losing a by-election in a seat that used to be held by Boris Johnson and had has been a conservative seat since its creation in 2010. You then choose to patronise Sadiq Khan further by saying he should reflect on this moment like he's some type of misbehaving school child. And then you have the issues of Sakir Rodney Starmer's stance on Israel's assault on the Gaza Strip. A lot of people are not happy and the weekly marches for a ceasefire don't seem to be getting smaller. Whereas Labour MPs are afraid to lose the whip for speaking out against general Starmer, Sadiq Khan doesn't have that restriction and has openly called for such action along with the Scottish Labour leader and I don't think Keir Starmer needs any more evidence of what happens when you openly back a potential genocide. You get your bum bum spanked by George Galloway and regardless of Keir Starmer's immaculate coping mechanism. Galloway only won because Labour didn't stand a candidate. I regret that we had to withdraw our candidate and apologise to voters in Rochdale, but I took that decision. It was the right decision. And when I say I've changed the Labour Party, I mean it. Yeah, we are all fully aware that you have changed the Labour Party, but maybe the Labour voters in Rochdale just didn't want to vote for a genocidal war anymore. So for the last time, I just want to remind everybody what the Labour members and by extension, the citizens of the UK could have had. I don't think there's anything extreme in a green industrial revolution, which invests in renewable energy, invests in green industrial jobs in order to reduce pollution and improve biodiversity and play our part in carrying out the targets of COP26 from Glasgow last year. I don't see anything very extreme in that. And instead show you how the most likely next Prime Minister of the UK treats current Labour supporters and members, therefore giving you a very good indication of how he will probably treat UK citizens. Look, we need a Green New look, Deal right now. Look, and you keep making my last turn. speech was about we this. Will you please, there's lots of people who want to hear this. Please don't drown them out. Please don't drown them out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Shouting slogans or changing lives conference.
Andrew Marr wrote an article for the Britain's left-wing magazine, The New Statesman. The article is titled, In 2024, Labour Must Offer Hope. It seems that many people that present as being on Keir's side are noticing that Keir is relying on the apathy shown towards the Conservative Party as a pathway to election victory. What's that old saying by that Italian guy? Never interrupt your enemy when he is making a mistake. Personally, I would say that Keir is doing everything in his power to ensure that there isn't any daylight between Labour and the Tories on everything you can think of because deep down, Keir is a conservative. I will always argue that Jeremy Corbyn was offering hope in 2017 and 2019. I believe that was actual genuine hope to change the lives of millions. But I also realise that politicians offering hope can mean devastation for others. People were voting for hope with Boris Johnson when he offered get Brexit done and that resulted in 179,013 Covid deaths in England between March 2020 and October 2022. I actually went to the office for national statistics and checked the numbers for COVID deaths. I clearly have too much time on my hands. Oh yeah, and let's not forget the public inquiry into why the government got the COVID response so goddamn wrong. People were voting for hope with Tony Blair and a conservative estimate of between 280,771 to 315,190 Iraqis died from direct war related violence alone. I'm done voting for hope. I just want change now. Once Keir Starmer becomes Prime Minister, if by some miracle he begins enacting left wing and progressive policies, I will eat my bicycle. And to be honest, I probably wouldn't even want those progressive policies because of what Keir did to get into power. But in my opinion, it's more likely that Tony Blair will appear as a defendant at The Hague for war crimes than it is that Keir Starmer will govern as a left-wing prime minister because of who he has already aligned himself with and the favours he will have to pay back once in power. I just feel it in my bones, despite what the new statesman and the Guardian are trying to convince me of otherwise. So that's the end of the video. If you've made it to this point, I cannot put into words how grateful I am. Please feel free to provide me with any feedback in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like. If you are new to the channel, please don't forget to subscribe. I've got more videos on the way. And if you're feeling extra generous, please feel free to check out my Patreon account. I will be back with a video focusing on absolutely anything else. I am exhausted with UK politics. Just allow me some time to figure out what the hell that will be. Until that time, ciao.